Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Community Church today. Good morning. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you're with us as well. Could we stand to our feet, please? We're going to start today by singing some songs of praise, but before we do, let's just take a moment to pray together, to center ourselves, to be fully present in this place before we sing to our Creator. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for bringing us here today. God, you knew that today was going to be today uh, when you created all things. And you knew that we would be here in this moment today. So would you help us to take advantage of the fact that we are here with you this morning, God? Would you help everything else to fade away so that our hearts and minds could be fully focused on you as we sing your praise, as we learn more about who you are and what you want for us? We worship you today. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen.
our hope today. today that it is well. For those today who are wondering where that provision is going to come from this next week or these next coming days, would you comfort us and tell us that it is well? For those who are in the midst of a raging sea, that it is well today. For those of us who are on the mountaintop today in celebration, I can see your goodness. Why would you confirm it as well? Jesus, we thank you for your presence. Would you give us that peace that surpasses all understanding? 
in these moments now, as we leave this place, as we go through our days, make it unmistakable to us that you are there and that through you, it is well. As we worship you now, we continue to focus our eyes on you in these moments. We pray in your name.
worship you today for who you are, for all you've done, for all you are doing. We worship you. We worship you. Everyone agreed with this prayer today and said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you all. Uh, go ahead. Grab a seat. Um, if it's your first time with us, just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you are here with us today. There's a card on the back of the seat in front of you, and if you want to scan that, that'll open up a form. You can let us know that you're new in that way, uh, or invite you to come down and just say hi to uh, myself or Gina afterwards, or to visit our welcome team members in the lobby. They'd love to answer questions and show you around the church if you're interested. Uh, we're just so glad that you're here and, and here to worship with us today. Uh, you know, yesterday, uh, as a nation, we celebrated Veterans Day. It's a, a day where we show our appreciation to the men and the women who have served in our military. And if you were with us two weeks ago, uh, you heard retired General Jim Mukuyama, who's a part of our congregation, uh, talk about some of the uh, challenges that face our veterans. And one of those being unemployment, which leads to homelessness. Uh, he shared how the VA will help them to get into apartments, but once they get into these apartments, they virtually have nothing because they're coming out of homelessness. And so last week we did a collection to help gather some of those kind of essential household items that they need to, to get started. And uh, you guys showed up and donated, and so we just wanted to revisit that today and say thank you to those of you that donated. I think there's some pictures popping up behind you of uh, some of the goods that came in. So. Again, thank you uh, for doing that. And what I'd like to do now is just take a moment uh, to pray for our veterans and to uh, pray especially for those who are receiving these gifts uh, that you donated as a church. So would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Father God, first I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, thanks for your grace and your mercies that are new each day. Uh, God, I thank you that we can gather freely in a place like this to learn about you, to open your word together, to worship you. And God, we thank you for the men and women who have uh, sacrificed and served uh, their country. Uh, God, we thank you for their families who have supported them. And Lord, I pray that these gifts that we've collected as a church, uh, that they would bring them uh, a sense of hope. Uh, I pray that it would remind them that they are seen and that they are appreciated. Uh, God, I pray that these gifts would make life just a little bit easier for them. But God, ultimately, we pray that these gifts would point them towards the gift that you give us in your son. Uh, God, that they would know that you see them, that you care for them, that you sent your son to die for them. And God, may they accept not only the eternal life that comes through faith in Christ, but live in the hope and the peace and the joy that you offer us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, uh, I'd love for you to uh, meet some of the folks around you. So I'm going to invite you to stand up again now that you've sat for a minute. And if you would, just kind of look around, uh, see who's near you that maybe you don't know quite as well. You can introduce yourself, share what town you're from, and I'll be back up in two minutes. We're going to continue on with the service here in just a moment, so grab your seat. There's something about today. Everybody's talkative. I didn't even stop giving the instructions, and you guys were talking already. And so that's great to hear. Great to hear. Hey, I'm with uh, my friend Elena here. Can you say hi to her? Hi, guys. Elena is going to be reading the scripture verse today that Gina will be teaching from. But before that, uh, we'd like to get to know you just a little bit. Can you tell us kind of where you're at in school? I'm a senior at New Trier. Okay, excellent. And uh, I know you're still in high school, but have you had any, like, actual jobs lately? I'm a lifeguard at the Glenview Park District. Excellent, excellent. All right. And have you had to use the whistle of power at all? At the of course. Floor? Yeah, nice, <laughs> excellent. Well, hey, how are you uh, involved here around the church? I'm involved in the Hope Kids. I volunteer in the K through two room, and I also go to the high school group. Excellent, excellent. So uh, if you would, would you just share the passage that you're gonna read and then go ahead and read that for us all this right. morning. This is Romans 10, nine through 11. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Great, all right, well can we thank Elena for uh, reading that passage and welcome Gina as she comes up to teach. Thank you so much, Elena and Jason, too. Thank you very much. 
Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be with those of you that are here in the room and those of you that are joining us online. And as many of you know, we're in a series in the book of Romans, and we're, we're getting towards the end of the series, but it got me thinking about uh, when I first got married. So uh, when we first got married, you know, I was really looking forward to like newlywed life and, uh, you know, just getting to spend our evenings together and all this stuff. And, and sometimes, you know, I'd come home and I'd be on the phone with my sister and my, my husband would hear, my husband's name is Sajeev, and Sajeev would hear me like on the other end of the conversation and it'd be something like this, like, oh, okay, uh-huh. No way. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. What happened next? Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Bye. You know, and then I hang up and he'd be like, what happened? And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was my sister. And she had just talked to my mom and you know, my mom had just gone to the grocery store, you know, not the one right by their house. Cause she doesn't like the produce there, but you know, it was like the one further away. And then, um, you know, while she was there, she ran into my aunt, not the one that she like, doesn't like to talk too much, but you know, the one on my dad's side and oh my gosh, my cousin made the volleyball team. I forgot to tell you, you know, and then he'd be like, could you just get to the point? And I'd be like, how rude I was getting there if you just stay with me, you know? And uh, I know some of you are getting really nervous, like, how long is this sermon going to go? That's how the conversation was, right? And uh, he, he finally just said to me, okay, if you could just give me the punchline first, that helped me a lot. And I was like, okay, fine, we can agree to that. But as I was thinking about where we are in Romans, you know, here's Paul, and he's been going on and on for a little while. Okay, he's been talking about the problem of sin and, and how we ought to be dead to sin, but so often we do the things we don't want to do, we don't do the things we ought to do. He talks about the law and how the Jewish people believe the law could save them, and he says now, hey, there's a new way, you don't need the law. And so he's going through all these different doctrines of justification, and he's explaining all these different things, and it's almost like you get to chapter 10 and someone's like, Paul, I get it, will you just get to the point? Like, like, how do I check box? How do I say, yes, I'm into this faith. I'm into it. How can I be saved? And Paul, in Romans 10, what you just heard Elena read, he gets right down to the point. What I love about parts of Romans is it's almost like you take the whole gospel and you condense it down in just to a couple of sentences. And here, here's Paul, and he's saying, hey, you want to be saved? You believe everything that I'm sharing with you? He says this, if you just declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's that simple. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And you hear this. It's a very simple explanation. Hey, if you want to say yes to faith, if you want to become a Christian, if you are into this faith, all you need to do is just believe it in your heart, and say it with your mouth. And you look at these two verses, and they're kind of like they change the order. First, it talks about professing with your mouth and then believing in your heart. The next verse talks about believing first and then sharing with your voice. And what I tell you is it's not the order that's so important. The idea is that these are intertwined. That what we believe in our heart ought to make its way through our lips. And there's something about our heart and our voice that's intertwined. It, it, nobody can see what's in our heart. Nobody can see what we really think or believe. The way they know that is by what we say and what we do. And as I was thinking about this idea, these two ideas of, of having a heart that believes and a mouth that professes faith, I was thinking about, you know, all the different people in Scripture. And, and who really embodies this? Like, who really has a big heart and maybe a big mouth, too? And as I was thinking about the disciples that followed Jesus, there's one that comes to mind in particular. His name is Peter. And if you're not familiar with Peter, he's the kind of guy, like, you don't have to wonder what he's thinking for very long because it's going to come out of his mouth, right? He is just, he can't like hold back. He just has to say whatever's on his mind. Uh, there's actually a story of this in the scripture where, uh, yeah, it got real for Peter because, uh, so Peter got invited by Jesus uh, to a mountaintop. Uh, Jesus invited actually just a couple of the disciples. It was just Peter, James, and John, and, and he invites them to the top of this mountain. And God appears, and, and so do Moses and Elijah at the top of this mountain. It's this really incredible moment. 
And Peter's saying this, and, and this is what he says in, in Matthew 17. He says, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's, it's good for all of us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. A voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, you got to read it carefully to catch this, but here's what's going on. You know, there's this majestic moment. Jesus is there with Moses and Elijah, and Peter's like, oh, I got a great idea. I'm going to build you guys some tents. Like, this is going to be awesome. And so he's going on and on. He's going on and on so much that God himself has to interrupt because it says, while he was still speaking, God's like, hey, hey, this is Jesus. Listen to him, you know? And it's the first time in the history of Scripture that God, like, shushes somebody. He's like, shh, Peter, that's enough. Like, we've, we've got it. This is Peter. He just says whatever's on his mind. And sometimes you think of that and you're like, ah, oh, it feels a little impulsive. You know, maybe that's not such a great characteristic. But Peter makes his way into the story of so many narratives throughout Scripture and some of the most famous miracles that you've heard of. Uh, maybe you've heard of the time that the disciples were in a boat and uh, Jesus appears walking on water. Now, most of the disciples, they're kind of frightened. They don't know what's going on. But Peter, you kind of see what's happening in his heart. He's seeing what's happening. And he's like, if that's really you, Lord, he says, let me come out on the water with you. And Jesus says, okay, come on out. So Peter goes and he walks on the water. A couple moments later, he notices the winds and the waves and starts to sink and, and Jesus has to lift him up and, and uh, he climbs back into the boat. And oftentimes we think about that, we're like, oh, what an incredible experience. Peter got to walk on the water. There were all these other disciples back in the boat. But it was Peter, something stirring in his heart that makes him jump out and say, I'm coming. I'm going to be with you. But what you may not remember about this passage is at the very end, as they climb back into the boat, Matthew 14 says this. It says, they climbed into the boat. The wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. This right here is the very first time that the disciples actually declare with their mouths who Jesus is. They've been thinking some things, and they've been watching Jesus perform miracles, but it's after Peter jumps out of the boat to walk on water, climbs back into the boat. That's the first time there's a connection that goes from the disciples' hearts to their mouths, and they finally recognize Jesus for who he is. It's what I love about Peter, is that you don't have to guess with him. And because of the way he is, he doesn't just come to faith himself, but he does something for the people around him. And as I was studying this passage over the last few weeks, I started to think about, well, what does this mean for us? What does it look like for our hearts and our mouths to be intertwined? Now, we're not Peter, but what does it look like for us to live that kind of life? And so today, I'm going to look at two aspects. Basically, what does it look like in our hearts and what does this look like, this kind of faith look like in our lips, through our voices? Now, starting with the heart. Now, here's the thing that the scripture here says something really interesting. It says, if you believe in your heart, believe in your heart. And when you think about that, it's actually a little bit strange because oftentimes when you think about belief, you think about your mind. You think, okay, is the sky blue? Yep, I can see it. Okay, yep, I believe the sky is blue. What's two plus two? Four. Okay, I can do the math in my head. I believe two plus two is four. And oftentimes we think of, okay, if we believe something, we've got to know it in our heads. But the scripture says something different here. It says you've got to believe this in your heart. The idea of this faith is not just an intellectual agreement to a set of beliefs. There's something that actually changes our hearts, that transforms us. That's not just this impersonal um, agreement to facts, but it's this, this capturing of our hearts, this devotion to Jesus. There's some emotion involved in it. It's, it's not just in your head. There's scripture that talks about that even the demons believe who Jesus is and they shudder. It's not that they trust him. It's not that they follow him. It's that they believe he has something to do with God. They've got something in their mind that says that. 
And as I was thinking about that, I was like, you know, this is kind of what it's like. I, I was talking to a cousin of mine a couple years ago, and he was in his mid-20s, and, and he was dating someone, and I was like, okay, well, tell me a little bit about her. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, she grew up out east, and she's got two brothers. Her parents still live out there, and uh, yeah, she went to college here, and, and then she decided to become a pharmacist, and you know, she got a scholarship for school, so it was really great, and, and she became a pharmacist, and, and now she works in a pharmacy, and, and she does that, but you know, someday she actually wants to like teach, she doesn't want to, and I was like, do you even like this girl? Like, you're giving me her resume, like this is, it's, it was strange, and needless to say, relationship didn't last, but it was one of those things where I'm like, okay, I can tell she checks all the boxes, but you don't really feel anything. And for some of you, maybe that's where you're at. If you're honest with your faith, like, yep, you can see where this makes sense maybe, and, and this faith checks the boxes, but it hasn't sunk down into your heart. And if you're here and seeking and exploring and you just want to know more, like, I'm so glad that you're here. Keep seeking. Uh, keep praying. Ask God to reveal himself to your heart, not just your mind. For some of you, maybe you've had a moment like that where, no, you knew your faith was real and you felt it. Uh, but over time, maybe your faith has waned a little bit. Maybe it's cooled. Maybe who Jesus is, like, just doesn't carry the same, like, awe for you anymore. And I encourage you, pray again for God to revive your heart for him. But some of you, your faith has kind of stayed in your head. And, and here's what I mean by this. A lot of times with really good intentions, we want to take our faith seriously. And so we say, you know, we're going to study scripture. And, and you dive in and you're studying and you're reading and you're, you're doing Bible studies. And that's all really, really good. And, and you're starting to dive into like, well, what does the original Greek or Hebrew mean? And what does that say? And what does this doctrine mean? And which, which viewpoint of this doctrine is correct? And what's incorrect? And what do I believe in? All of those things are really good. And it's, it's good to examine our faith from an intellectual perspective. I believe our faith can stand up to that kind of examination. But sometimes what can happen is what this 19th century preacher Sp Charles Spurgeon says. He says that sometimes your brain can swell and your heart can shrivel. Like you can spend so much time thinking and learning and your faith doesn't actually do anything to change your heart. And this faith that we have, this is not a belief in your head. This is a belief in our heart kind of faith. And that's the point that Paul is making here. It's not just that. Uh, Paul's saying, hey, listen, this belief can't just live in your heart. It's actually got to come out through your mouth. And some of you maybe grew up in traditions where faith was really a private thing or, or that's just kind of the family you grew up in. Like, yep, you can have your faith, but it's really private. We don't really talk about it. We don't share about it with anyone. But when you look at Paul's words here, it's clear. Faith is not just a private belief in our heart. There's something that gets professed with our lips. And I would hear people talk about this sometimes and say, you know, it's kind of like sharing about your favorite restaurant. Like, of course, if you've got a place that you love to eat, you want to tell everybody about it. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's not quite like that because there's sometimes stigma about talking about things like politics and religion. It's, it can be harder than that. Now, quick survey, I want you to be honest, and uh, just to check in, how many of you, if you're honest, you're like, actually, like, I find it pretty easy to share about my faith. Quick show of hands. How many of you say, yeah, I, I actually, it's not that hard for me to talk about my faith. I see a few hands go up. And I love it. Some of you may have the gift of evangelism. Like, this comes naturally to you, and we actually need to hear from you more. We need to hear from you in our small groups and even in our conversations. Like, how do you do this? How do you share your faith? For me, I was like, this to me felt really hard. But, you know, you see these words of Paul here, and it's not just Paul. Jesus has some things to say about how we share our faith as well. And oftentimes, we think of Jesus as like really nice and loving and good and kind. And he is good and kind and loving. He's all those things. But he's also really direct in Scripture. Sometimes, like, it's uncomfortable direct. And actually, in Matthew 10, he says this, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. And I'm like, ooh, that's, that's harsh, right? Like, I was like, okay, I don't want that to be true of me. 
And one day I was sitting in a church service like this, and, and the pastor was talking about this verse and was like, you know, uh, you want to speak about your faith. You don't want to deny Jesus here on earth. He'll deny you in heaven. I was like, okay, yeah, no, I don't want that to be true of me. And so uh, the pastor's challenge was like, you know, think of someone you know in your life that, that maybe doesn't have a faith and, and share with them your faith. And so I was like, okay. And so I kind of felt this nudge. I, I thought about a friend of mine. And I was like, you know, I think he goes to church on like Christmas and Easter, but faith isn't really important to him. And so I'm like, okay, I, I think it's him. I think I'm supposed to share my faith with him. And so I started to like think about it. I'm like, okay, all right, I think I know what I'm gonna say. I'm like, okay. So I pick up the phone, I call him up, and you know, we get to talking and you know, the feel this like lull in the conversation. And so I'm like, okay, um, you know, something I wanna I wanna tell you about. And he's like, okay, yeah, what's going on? And uh, I said, well, um, back in 1984, my parents took me to this church and like I just started going because that's where my family went. And then um, a few years later, I went to this youth camp and, and they talked about believing in Jesus. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I think I want to do that. But then, like, then a few years later, I talked about, like, you can't just believe in Jesus. Like, you really got to follow him with your life. And, like, 47 minutes later, like, I'm still going on. I mean, you can sense this theme in my life, right, you know? And uh, going on and on and on. And I literally, I was like in the middle of it and I'm like, I have no exit strategy. Like, I don't know how to get out of this conversation. And so I finally get to the end of it and I'm like, yeah, so, so that's what I thought I was supposed to tell you. Long, awkward pause, right? And he goes, thank you? And I'm like, okay, I'll see you this weekend, bye. And I just hang up the phone. You know, like I had no idea what to do with that. But I got off the phone and I was like, uh, that was awkward for him. It was awkward for me. I was like, God, if this is what I'm supposed to do, like, I can't do it. Like, this is maybe meant for the evangelist. This is, like, for someone else. Like, I, I don't know how to share my faith. Like, this is, I don't know. you got to find someone else. And so for a few years, to be quite honest, like, I really didn't share much of my faith with anyone. I felt like, man, I, I don't know to the state if that guy still believes. And I was like, I probably ruined it for him. You know, I was like, I don't want to hurt anybody else. And so I, I really didn't share my faith much. And then several years later, I got a card from a friend, and it was on my birthday, and, and she just kind of shared a bunch of different things, and, and she shared, you know, I don't know if you know this, but, um, you know, I credit you with bringing me to faith. And I, I read that line, and I was like, I kind of taken it back. I, was, I, I just didn't expect that. And then she went on to write some things, and, and I was like, you know, of course, this is God that brought you to faith, but I was, like, reflecting on, on what happened and what she shared, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, she had been my friend for several years and I was going to church and so one day I just said, hey, um, I kind of felt this like nudge, like maybe I should just ask her to join me and so I said, hey, you come, come with me to church and she's like, okay. And then uh, she started coming a little more and, and there were times that she faced some really difficult things in her life and, and I just showed up like I thought any good friend does, you know, and, um, and I wasn't the one that like said the prayer with her or anything like that, but over time, in a quiet moment on her own, she came to faith. And when she wrote that, I was like, well, if that's what it is, I can do that. You know, like I can be friends with people. Like that works for me. I was like, that feels natural to me. And as I was thinking about all of us and how we're to actually live out these words that Paul shares, I actually started thinking about kids' sports. Now, stay with me for a second. Like, uh, when my kids were growing up, and it, they still are growing up, but when they were, like, younger, like, third, fourth grade, they were both into basketball. And this is the time where, like, some kids are in the sport just because, like, their parents are like, hey, try some stuff out, see if you like it. And, and some kids are, like, really good. And, and I remember my son was on a team, and uh, every game they'd lose, like, 38 to 2. You know, like, it was awful. And uh, one day, you know, there's this one kid who he's like, I'm just done with all you jokers. And so he got the ball and he's like, I, no one's getting this ball. So he's dribbling down the court. Literally, the other team forms like a brick wall. And he's like, I don't care. I'm running right through him. And, you know, all his teammates are open. He's not passing the ball. He's like, I am getting to the basket, you know. And throughout the game, he was just a ball hog. You know, you know the type. You've seen this in kids, right? And, and he was like, I don't care what else is going around me. I'm driving the hoop. And when I thought about how I first tried to share the good news of Jesus with that friend of mine, I was like, oh, that's what I was doing. 
I was like, I'm not listening to him. I'm not asking him questions. I've got an agenda here that I'm going to share this with him, and I'm going to get to the hoop. I'm going to get to the end of this, and then I've done my part. And I was like, I don't, I don't think that's what sharing our faith is supposed to be like. But there's another kind of player on these teams as well. Uh, last year, my daughter was, was playing on some, uh, some basketball teams. We'd go to the games, and, like, you know, you'd see the ball hit the rim, and come down, and it was literally like all the kid had to do was like lift their hands barely above their heads and they'd be able to catch it. But instead what you'd see is like, oh my gosh, like the ball was like radioactive, right? And they were like, please don't let the ball touch my hands. You see this in these kids, like somebody would pass them the ball, they'd get it, they'd look shocked, and then just be quickly like looking around like, how do I get this out of my hands as quick as possible, you know? And they'd try to pass it. And for some of us, there's opportunities to share about our faith. Someone asks a question or says something, and we are like, is there any other Christian here that can do something about this? Like, we don't want the ball. And as I, I think about what God calls us to, what he has done in our lives, the news that we can share, that we get to share with others, I wonder what it would be like for us to figure out actually what's natural for us. Not that we're the ball hog that we're going to drive to the hoop no matter what, ignore everything around us. And not that we're going to avoid it at all costs, but actually to like look at ourselves and say like, you know, what comes naturally to me? Uh, maybe like me, you're like, you like building friendships with people. That comes easy. And, and you like to build relationships and just kind of naturally invite people into your life and what you're doing. Maybe you have a, like a relational friendship style. I have a friend who I would call his style of sharing his faith uh, conversational. Like, he has this way of, if you're in a group conversation and the, it's pretty superficial, like you're talking about the weather and sports, like, he'll ask a question and all of a sudden the conversation will turn a little bit deeper. And he'll turn things spiritual and it's not awkward, it feels very natural, but he has this gift of just of being in conversation and just steering that. Uh, maybe you have a style that's invitational, like you're the kind of person who, you're like, hey, Christmas Eve service is coming up. If you've got nowhere to go, join me. Come sit with my family. Like, let's go out to dinner after. You're, you're good at inviting people. Uh, maybe for some of you, you're actually way better at telling your story of faith than I am. Uh, maybe you can tell your faith story in a quick way that's pretty compelling. Um, Jason, who you just heard from, this past week, we had several high school students visit our building. Uh, they're a class, world religions class from GBN, from Glenbrook North, and uh, they're visiting different religious buildings in the area, and so they came here. And the vast majority of them had never seen, like, church in a gym, right? Like, they just never heard of that. And so they were really curious, and so we were like, yeah, actually, you know, during the week we clear the chairs out, and, and we play sports in here. And I was like, hey, you know, Jason, share a little bit. And, and uh, many of you have heard Jason's story, and I've heard it before too, but he just, in a couple of minutes, talked about his life before God, how God used sports to transform him, and how he's, his life has changed. And again, I've heard the story before, and I was still, like, hanging at the edge of my seat. Like, he had just a way of sharing his story that, like, that drew in the kids, that engaged everyone. And so maybe for you, that's, that's your style. It's a more, like, testimonial style. Maybe you have a more service style of sharing your faith. Like, you see a need, and you can show up for people, and you pray for them, and, and you tangibly support people when they're hurting. Like, maybe that's your style. But what I encourage you to do is actually think about it, like what is it that God has naturally kind of gifted you and wired you to do? And you don't have to force the ball down the court. You don't have to shy away. You can actually kind of out of who you are, share your faith. Now, as I was thinking about myself, I was like, you know, you can't build friendships with everyone, but you can be friendly with people. And one of the things that I think we can do is actually just invite God in, invite him into our conversations, our interactions, and just say, God, I'm open. Uh, Holy Spirit, would you just like nudge me or prompt me if I'm supposed to say anything? And, and it's funny, I've done this sometimes getting into an Uber and like we'll have this incredible conversation or, or sometimes it's like the cashier at Walgreens and like we just get to talking and, and sometimes nothing happens, but sometimes the conversation turns and I get to invite them to church or or it just turns a little spiritual. And, it, and it's not like, you know, we're saying the prayer uh, together right in that moment and someone comes to faith, but it's, it's like I just maybe inbounded the ball or just dribbled up a few feet. And it's just this idea of being open to how God is working, maybe in a style that's very natural to you, but being intentional about it. 
Now, sometimes when we share our faith, it's like that. Like, it's, okay, this is kind of natural. It feels good. It feels easy. But there are times that an opportunity will present itself that, to be honest, doesn't feel very natural. Maybe it feels kind of awkward, but it's kind of this moment where you're like, should I say something? Should I do something? And I actually saw one of these moments play out on national television. Now, it happened on God's favorite network. Anyone want to guess what that is? What is that? TBN? I heard. No, no. It was ESPN. It was ESPN that this happened. And, uh, and here's what happens. This was uh, back to January. You know, my house, Monday nights, we'll typically have the football game on. And uh, often, most of the time, like on Monday nights, you know, if it's a game that we care about, we'll watch. But otherwise, it'll be on in the background. And, and this time, if it was the uh, Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals. And it wasn't a game I was super into, so I was kind of multitasking. But I noticed there was like an injury on the field. And if you ever watch football, you know what happens. It's, this is pretty common. You know, someone will get injured and they'll kind of hobble off the field. Or if it's really bad, you know, a cart will come and wheel them off. And then, you know, everybody will applaud and, and the game goes on. But this time, the game stopped. And I was like, oh, something's going on. Like, the game's not getting started again. And, and they're showing an ambulance coming onto the field. And, and panning to like players who look really emotional and you can see they're like, they're crying on the field. I was like, what's going on? And it turns out there was this football player, Damar Hamlin, and he um, got hit pretty hard and, and uh, he was down on the field and uh, you know, it was a really serious situation. They didn't know how it was gonna turn out. It was the first time in the history of watching football that I've ever seen them stop a game. They actually just stopped it and said, okay, we're not gonna play the rest of this game. And I was like, this is, crazy. And, you know, turns out he made a full recovery. He's playing football again. But in that moment, no one really knew what was happening. No one knew if he was going to be okay. And, um, you know, the NFL was calling for, you know, thoughts and prayers. And every NFL team actually changed their Twitter, like, background to be a picture of his jersey and just said, hey, pray for DeMar, you know. And, and it was just this moment that I was like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. I've never seen this. But then I was watching ESPN, and, and there was this moment where this guy, he had a moment like this where it was like, should I say something, shouldn't I? And, uh, you know, I normally wouldn't play like a whole minute-long clip, but I thought this one was worth it. And I want you to watch this guy. He's a newscaster with ESPN, and I just want you to watch his body language. Uh, I want you to listen to the words that he says in this moment that I think was a prompting from God. So let's take a look. Football gave me everything. You know, and I think even through the midst of absolute tragedy last night, I think you saw some of the beauty of football mm -hmm. as well, that it's brought us all here together. Um, you know, like, this is a little bit different. I heard, I've heard it all day, like, thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say that we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want to, it's just on my heart that I want to pray for it is. DeMar Hamlin right, right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him. Um, God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, uh, because we believe that you're God, and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're... we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you, and pray for strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar, to be with his family, to give them peace. If we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer, we believe in prayer, we lift up DeMar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 Yeah. You know, you think about it in that moment. Like, you saw it in his face. Like, he's looking down. If you actually notice his hands, he's kind of just like tapping the desk. He says, like, I don't even know if this is the right thing to do. And really, he has no idea if his job is going to be on the line after this, but there is something happening to him where he's like, I just have to pray. And he takes this risk. 
And sometimes you and I are going to face a moment like this where it doesn't feel natural. Maybe it feels really awkward. Maybe it doesn't feel like, ah, I don't know if this is the right thing. But you take the step and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. And you see, and because of prayers like this, I believe this, this football player makes this recovery. In fact, the doctors, when he kind of came to, he still had tubes down his throat, and, uh, and he wrote on a piece of paper, who won the game? And the doctors were like, you did. You won the game of life. Like, that's what they responded to him. But you see this guy, he takes this risk. He steps out, and he doesn't know what it's going to cost him, but he follows the prompting. And maybe uh, some of you are thinking, okay, well, he's a professional newscaster. Like, I don't know, I still, I'm not sure if I can do this. Well, I want to take you back to Romans 10 because it does lay out some qualifications for those people who are going to share their faith. It says, here's what it says in Romans 10, 14. It says, how then can they, people who don't have faith yet, how can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? I want to look at that last sentence because I think it lays out the qualifications really clearly here. It says, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Here are the qualifications to share your faith. You've got to be someone. That's it. It doesn't say you've got to have a degree in ministry, that you've got to be a small group leader, that you've got to have your life together. It doesn't say that you've got to be the most eloquent person or funny or creative or anything like that. It says, how will they hear without someone preaching to them? And the truth is you and I have people in our lives who don't know God, who are far from him. And we are the someones that are called to preach. And I think oftentimes in these moments, it can feel really hard. Like, what do I say? What do I do? God has given us everything we need. He's not asking you to be anything you're not. Share whatever is on your heart naturally in your words. Because they can't hear unless someone shares with them. And so as we close today, I just have a few questions I want you to consider this week. Um, if you're in your small groups or even around a dinner table, but... One is just to think about what style of sharing your faith is most natural for you. Are you more relational or, or conversational or maybe intellectual, like you like to use things like science and history to talk about faith, or, or maybe you're good at sharing your story, you've got a testimonial style. What's, what comes naturally for you? And then are you open, are you sensitive to God's leading, to his spirit whispering and nudging to you? Are you just open to Share your faith, to prompts, to maybe bring something up, to ask if you can pray. And finally, who in your life, who is it in your circles, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, who is it that needs to hear the news, the good news of grace that we find in Jesus? Now, I'll be honest, after I failed that first time, I was like, I'm not going to do this for a while. Maybe like me, you haven't shared your faith much, and this feels uncomfortable because you've had some bad experiences in the past. Uh, maybe you've looked around at, like, uh, the reputation of Christians and the church, or maybe, you know, pastors have disappointed you, churches have disappointed you. You're like, I don't, I don't really know if I can share this. And what I want to remind us, because I've been there, what I want to remind us is that we're not calling people to follow a pastor or a church or even other Christians. We're calling people to introduce them to Jesus. And if you've known the love of Jesus in your life, when you've felt unlovable, if you've known the forgiveness of Christ, when you have felt shame and guilt, if you've known his power in your life, his peace and his comfort, then the best thing that you can do is share with people, not just for their eternity, but that Jesus is available to them right now where they're at. Peter Big heart, big mouth, Peter, he goes and he just, he can't help but share what's on his mouth. He can't, what's in his heart, he can't help but jump out of that boat. And it might have been awkward, but he jumps out of the boat. And because of that, because he takes a step in faith, he gets to participate in this miracle that we're still talking about today. But it takes this leap of faith. 
Uh, Peter, his heart is so convicted by this message that after Pentecost in Acts 2, we read about Peter. People are showing up to find out what's going on. Peter starts to preach, and 3,000 people are added to the church. Uh, Peter is, is Jewish, and he's really uncomfortable being around non-Jewish people, but, but this guy, Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion, Italian descent, he invites Peter over to his house. Peter doesn't want to go, but he goes, shares the gospel, and, Peter, and Cornelius' entire family comes to faith. And you and I have people in our lives that we are called to be that kind of person to, to be that someone to that is going to share what God has done in our lives. So will you be open? This week, will you be open to the Spirit's promptings? Will you be open to his leadings? Will you look around for the people in your life that need to hear the good news of grace? And will you share with them? Will you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Oh, God. Oh. God, thank you for the simple message of grace that, that it's simple that we just believe in our hearts and just say it. And God, for um, those here that maybe their hearts feel really far from you, God, I pray that you make yourself real. Uh, I pray that they would sense how much you love them and care for them, that um, the belief wouldn't just be something in their minds or in their heads, but it'd be something that seeps deep down and our hearts. And God, I pray too that, God, we wouldn't just have hearts devoted to you, although that's the most important thing, but that, God, we would have hearts open to the people around us too that, that would see people who need you, see the people that you've created, and God, that we'd just be open to how you're leading us, that we would open our mouths, that we would offer to pray, that we would share a little bit of our story, that we would um, show up for people and introduce them to you. God, would you give us courage? Would you prompt us? And God, would you build your kingdom through us? God, we know you're not just building Hope Community Church. You're building your church. You're building your kingdom. And we want to be a part of it. We don't want to miss it. God, would you help us to just be open to having an eternal impact? <clears throat> would you open our hearts? Would you speak through our lips? And God, would you build your kingdom here through us? We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be with all of you today. One last part of the service, and that's our announcement. So would you join me in welcoming Jason up? All right, yeah, just a couple of things before you head out today uh, for you to be aware of. In December, on December 6th, we're going to offer a uh, holiday grief support group. Um, I lost my dad about seven years ago, and for the first four years after that, I kind of walked through the grieving on my own, thought I was doing well, and I decided, uh, I was at a church, I decided we should offer some sort of support group for people that have lost a loved one. And so I, I led that group, and in the process of leading it, uh, I realized that there was a lot that I had not processed, and, uh, and I personally got a lot out of that group. There was something powerful about being able to talk about my loss with others who actually weren't family, made it a little bit easier. Uh, I took away some great tips from it, and, uh, and I just felt like this is something that I'd love to be able to offer for our church as well. And so uh, if you have uh, lost someone, first I want to say I am so sorry for that. Uh, and second, I want to invite you to this group. And it may be someone you've lost just in the last year, or like me, maybe it's somebody that you lost five, even ten years ago. Uh, whatever the case, you're welcome to this group. And so if you'd like to be a part of it, uh, you can register online. If you have questions, just find me. I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, second thing I wanted to mention is, uh, you know, our PADS group, which has been serving the homeless in our area on Thursday nights by providing a place for them to sleep, to have dinner, breakfast the next morning, and a lunch to take with them the next day. That group's been meeting for two weeks now, doing a great job. So just a shout out to those volunteers. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, we're anticipating that for Thanksgiving it might be a little bit more challenging to get the food and the people that we need to fill those shifts. And so just want to ask you guys if you would pray about maybe uh, helping out in that way. Uh, again, you can register for that on our website at the events page. And then lastly, uh, there's a group of volunteers that uh, when we first moved into this building about a year ago said, if you need help in any way, just send me an email, let me know, and uh, we'll, you know, if I'm free, I'll come and help out. 
And so for the last year, I've emailed the same group of 80 people pretty much every week saying, here's the projects for the week. And on Friday, they've come, they've helped out. Other people have helped out during the week to pick up our Roman study guide books or to paint a room or whatever needs to be done. And uh, so I just wanted to put the ask out there to our greater church community and say, if you ever have availability, if you'd be willing to be on a list where you would hear about the needs around the church and just kind of jump in where you can when you're free, uh, you can do that by scanning that QR code that's in front of you on that little piece of paper. Just in the memo section, uh, write in like volunteer team or ad hoc team, and I'll add you to that list. Uh, We have a lot of fun doing this stuff, and honestly, like we could not get done the work that we've done around this church without uh, that group of people. So uh, I think that's it. Lastly, if you came ready to give, there's a giving box in the back where you can uh, drop that off on your way out. Have a great week. We'll see you back next Sunday, if not sooner. Take care.